Hello, my name is Dr. Thomas Burke. I am the medical director of NeuroHealth, and this lecture is about what happens in your brain during a migraine, or what we like to term in medical parlance as migraine pathophysiology. So how does a migraine happen? So first, just a little bit about myself. I am a neurologist and a specialist in New York City. I graduated um, from the NYU Grossman School of Medicine in 2010. I completed residency in general neurology. Uh, also at NYU, I completed a headache fellowship at Jefferson. And since then, I have been an assistant professor uh, and associate fellowship director uh, at NYU. And I am now the medical director of NeuroHealth where we aim to give high quality headache healthcare to everybody, wherever you are. So what is a migraine anyway? And I think we just have to define the term. And this is based on the international classification of headache disorders. So everyone has to define what they're talking about in order uh, for us to really uh, have a common language. So what is a migraine? The International Headache Society in their Headache Bible, the International Classification of Headache Disorders, defines a migraine as somebody who experiences, somebody with migraine as somebody who experiences at least five attacks. Those attacks last four to 72 hours, so a while. The headache has to be, has to have at least two of the four pain characteristics, which are unilateral, which means one-sided, and that can switch sides, pulsating, or throbbing in quality, so it feels like boom, boom, boom. Moderate to severe in pain intensity, which means on a pain scale, it is somewhere between the four to nine range. And it's aggravated by, or, or it causes avoidance of physical activity, i.e. every little thing that you try to do when you have the migraine worsens migraine. Um, during a headache, oftentimes you'll notice nausea and or vomiting. So these are what we call non-pain symptoms or sensitivities. Photophobia means light sensitivity and phonophobia. So you have to experience one of those. And with every definition of a headache disorder in this classification, we always say that if it seems like another headache or another thing could be causing this, it's not migraine. So that's always the caveat. So to kind of sum it up, it's a longer lasting, pretty severe, mostly throbbing headache with pain and non-pain symptoms. And it can be sometimes debilitating. And some people with migraine, in addition to their pain symptoms and some of those sensitivities, experience something called aura. Aura basically is defined as neurological symptoms that occur primarily before, very rarely during or after the actual attack. Most oftentimes these are visual they're described, and we'll see some pictures of them, as zigzag lines, distortions of color, an area in the center of vision that's blurred, and that can move slowly from one side of your visual field from everything that you see to the other. In some people, it's very interesting. When you close your eyes, you actually notice when you close one eye, it's on the right side of that eye. When you close the other eye, it's again on the right side of that eye. And um, you know, it affects the right visual field, not necessarily the right eye. So in other people, it's the opposite. It's possible for you to have um, um, an aura that affects sensation. So that can be um, numbness and tingling. And oftentimes it spreads, let's say from the hand up the arm to the face. It's possible even to have what some people describe as a brainstem aura. So those are other kinds of symptoms that are not necessarily sensory or visual, but these are things like vertigo, a spinning sensation, lightheadedness, word finding difficulty, brain fog or difficulty concentrating. Hemiplegia means one side of the body 
is weak. And it's even possible to have a subtype of migraine, especially a familial subtype. We'll talk maybe a little bit about that soon. And sometimes migraine can really look like a stroke. Oftentimes people can come into an emergency room and actually be recommended, and sometimes it's even appropriate, a big clot-busting drug called TPA because the doctors there are very concerned that it might be a stroke. These are some visualizations of what migraine aura may look like, the zigzag lines, the colors, the area of blurred vision in the middle of your visual field, etc. So what causes this entire process? So this picture over here shows a lot of very complicated things. And in general, migraine is a complex phenomenon and it definitely affects every part of the brain. Migraine affects every aspect of what the brain does. It affects sensation. It affects the blood vessels of the brain. It affects inflammation around the brain. And we will get into exactly how all of this occurs very, uh, very soon. So one of the most important things to, you know, wrap your head around is the fact that migraine is a complex phenomenon and it involves the genes of the brain, the blood vessels of the brain, neurotransmitters, which are the chemicals that allow the brain to communicate, uh, the neurons in the brain to communicate, hormones affect migraine, the electrical activity of the brain um, is, is uh, dysregulated, and putting all of this together, this kind of you know, perfect storm is what happens during a migraine attack. So the first thing that you have to realize is migraine is very strongly familial. There's even, there are even subtypes of migraine, such as familial hemiplegic migraine. These are, uh, these run extremely strong in families. There are other rare genetic migraine syndromes. A lot of these have really long names, so we give them acronyms such as MILAS, which stands for mitochondrial encephalopathy with lactic acidosis and stroke, cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy. It's not important to necessarily know what those things are. They're rare genetic conditions that have migraine plus other neurological issues. What's important to know is that this has helped us basically identify a number of genes associated with migraine. Now, what do those genes code? So one of the interesting things that we've noticed from the beginning with migraine is migraine is unique because there's a throbbing sensation. And because of that, many people, many great scientific minds had always considered migraine being primarily due to alterations in blood flow around the brain, cerebral blood flow. And as I uh, was mentioning, the genes that are coded with migraine, those same genes code migraine and code certain vascular factors, certain things on the surface of blood vessels, which, which is called endothelium. And for that reason, many of the first migraine medicines that were given to stop a migraine were vasoconstrictive medicines. The theory was that there's all this dilation of blood vessels that causes throbbing and you feel pulses in your brain because of your blood pressure and that's what happens. And most of the first preventive medicines were also blood pressure medicines primarily. And we now know that this is a gross oversimplification. We know that there, there are changes that definitely occur in the blood vessels around the brain. That's not actually what causes the pain and it's much more complicated than that. So vasculature plays a role, but it is a somewhat limited role. Now, what about neurotransmitters? Neurotransmitters are the ways that neurons speak to each other in the brain. They're released during a migraine attack, and many times 
specific inflammatory neurotransmitters. And there's one that's called CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide. They can actually trigger a migraine attack. And what was very interesting is there was uh, a model of migraine in humans that was developed where they're able to create this CGRP protein. They were able to make it, develop it in a lab, and they were able to give it through uh, an IV to people who had a predisposition to migraine and people who didn't, based on their family, based on genetics, based on their own history. And anyone who was predisposed to migraine got a migraine and people who didn't would have maybe a very dull, you know, superficial pain around the head, kind of tensiony, but not an actual migraine, not that severe throbbing pain with those associated symptoms. Importantly, some of the genes that code for migraine also code for specific neurotransmitters and neurotransmitter systems or neurotransmitter problems and deficiencies. And for this reason, oftentimes during a migraine, certain neurotransmitters are dysregulated. We know that dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, as well as a number of other brain neurotransmitters are dysregulated during migraine. And there are other inflammatory neurotransmitters that can also trigger migraine in a similar way that CGRP does. For instance, substance P and vasoactive intestinal peptide, in addition to a number of other uh, newer uh, proteins that uh, we're looking at right now. Hormones and migraine. Hormones definitely play a major role in migraine. One of the reasons why women develop migraine at a three to one rate more than men is specifically because uh, women have fluctuations of hormones throughout the, uh, throughout the month and men don't. And for that reason, there are subtypes of migraine, for instance, menstrual migraine uh, that can happen that are directly related to hormonal changes. And one of the things that we definitely see, especially uh, in women, is that the highest prevalence within uh, um, women uh, of migraine really is during uh, reproductive ages. Oftentimes, the first time that uh, you may develop migraine is right around the time when you start to get your period. And oftentimes, women can age out of migraine as they get closer to menopause. Not everybody but certainly in some people. One of the things that we know about migraine is that migraine does um, actually imply a slight vascular risk for things like stroke and heart attack. Statistically, it's significant, although much less of a risk factor than things like um, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, obesity, or high cholesterol. That being said, migraine with aura is an even higher vascular risk factor. And for this reason, it is very controversial to actually use estrogen, especially at high doses in uh, people who have um, migraine and uh, oftentimes um, low dose estrogen containing medications can actually be somewhat helpful in preventing menstrual migraine. Um, so there's almost like a double-edged sword in that estrogen can be something that can sometimes be helpful on the other hand, because it is uh, pro-thrombotic, estrogen can cause um, you know, blood clots to worsen to an extent. It is uh, somewhat controversial. So uh, especially if there's migraine aura, and this is definitely um, something that you would need to extensively discuss probably with both your neurologist and headache specialist and your OBGYN. 
One of the things that I had mentioned is that the electrical activity of the brain is also dysregulated during migraine. And one of the things that was actually first discovered about migraine is that the aura of migraine is caused by abnormal electrical activity, almost like a seizure, but seizure affects deeper areas of the brain. And migraine aura is the cortex, is the surface. The technical term for this is a cortical spreading depression, depression not as in mood depression, depression as in a polarization of electrical activity. And it was actually measured and it's relatively consistent, somewhere between two and six millimeters over the surface of the brain per minute. And sometimes we even see this abnormal electrical activity chronically generalized over the entire surface of the brain if uh, migraine becomes very, very frequent. We call that cortical hyperexcitability. So these are a lot of somewhat technical terms, but we do know that the electrical activity of the brain is very affected during migraine, especially in migraine with aura. And for this reason, many anti-seizure medicines were used especially early on uh, um, when there were very few uh, preventive options for migraine, uh, topiramate and uh, valproic acid, uh, also known as Topamax and Depakote, uh, are probably two of the most widely used anti-seizure medicines for migraine prevention. So let's put it all together. What exactly happens during a migraine and what is happening in the brain? So the first thing that happens before the migraine attack is a prodrome. Oftentimes these are symptoms kind of like the migraine, oftentimes not the pain, but the sensitivities that people can notice hours, even up to days before the actual migraine attack. And aura can happen in people who have migraine with aura. And those are what we mentioned before, the transient neurological symptoms, typically never longer than 45 minutes to an hour, oftentimes just minutes. The attack itself is where there's the pain, the sensitivities, and the GI symptoms like nausea and vomiting. And then there's oftentimes a postdrome. These can be hours to days after the attack. And just like the prodrome, these are typically the, 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 the sensitivities rather than the actual pain of migraine. There's an interictal period that we talk about, which is the time in between attacks. For many people, you are 100% pain-free. For many other people, there is still something that you may experience. It may be tensiony pain around the head with tenderness of some of the muscles in the neck or, or the temples or around the head. It can be light sensitivity that's chronic or nausea or other symptoms uh, that are chronic that are also related to migraine. So what happens in the brain during these periods? First, in the prodrome, there are early changes that can be seen, especially with dysregulation of certain neurotransmitters of the brain. The aura itself is what we spoke about with the abnormal electrical activity of the brain. There's release of inflammatory neurotransmitters. During the attack itself, there's a release of inflammatory neurotransmitters that cause irritation of the covering of the brain, areas where there are a lot of nerves around the blood vessels. And this can definitely start to cause some of these sensitivities and that throbbing sensation. And one of the interesting things about the throbbing sensation is that we don't think that it's related to your heart rate or blood pressure, more likely it's related to pulsations of the fluid in the brain, the spinal fluid, the CSF. In the post-drome of migraine, there are still residual changes, just like in the prodrome, there are mild changes that occur. In the post-drome, there are residual changes in the neurotransmitters of the brain similar to what we see in the prodrome, where there are early changes related to um, certain dysregulated neurotransmitters. And it's just that 
the pattern of neurotransmitters hasn't fully resolved and hasn't become totally normal. And like we said before, with the interictal period, there is relative quiet. And when migraine becomes chronic, there can be changes to the neurotransmitters and electrical activity of the brain that continues. If you have any questions, we are very happy to answer all of your questions. And just to let you know, neurologists that specialize in headaches see all kinds of complicated issue, uh, headache issues day in and day out. And if you have any questions about your own headaches, how to treat them, what medical or non-medical options are available, we are available for you. You can have a video visit with us, with myself, with many of the other doctors, and uh, we can try to come up with an individualized approach for each patient and recommend customized treatment plans based specifically on your situation. We choose doctors that are specialized in diagnosing and treating all kinds of headache disorders. And all of us have seen all different aspects of headache. If you think that you've seen everyone or if you think that you've exhausted all potential options, please, you should know that that is not the case. Thank you very much. And reach out to us.